Latin years of World War II, also an interesting reminder of uh, this aeroplane that, of course, many retired ex-British frontline aircraft of the Second World War went on to have second operational lives with other countries, having been sold on, having mentioned France's aeronautique naval in the context of the Morin Saulnier MS317 that we saw arriving earlier. This Seafire indeed saw service in its latter operational years with the French Air Naval. It indeed was privately owned in France, albeit not airworthy, for some time thereafter.
Just caution Anderson departing before you before you release. Oh, Anderson, you ready? Anderson. Ready for departure. Anderson, take off your discretion. Surface wind two five zero degrees one two knots. Take off, Anderson.
them, and we're on the way to retrieve it. friendly fire. The American Navy gunners had no idea that there were going to be any aeroplanes in the vicinity that were, were there. So unfortunately they opened fire on the poor old cubs and with a 65 mile an hour cruising speed you were a sitting duck. The L4 cubs went on to operate heroically in so many theatres of the Second World War flying from some pretty awkward locations, small platforms in densely forested areas um, off cliff tops in Normandy, that sort of thing. All recall when we see a cub flying today. Of course, many of the earlier J3 cubs that we see as air shows are genuine warbirds because they saw extensive service in the... in perfect harmony there, the two 420 horsepower up at the Avro Anson went on to be a mainstay of that work. And in 1940 as well, Flight of Three Anson was attacked by nine Luftwaffe Messerschmitt 109s. It's got to be said they have to be rookies because by the time the dogfight ended, without losing any of their own, by flying in tight circles, one of the Anson crews placed their squad two German aircraft and damaged the third. Well, it's quite funny 
you because one of its pilots at the time and an additional start of magneto gives a literally a shower of sparks to the engine to allow once the mixture is being evened up in the cylinders hopefully the engine will burst into life.
water.
day, you won't fly him out. Oh, of course, I'm not going to stop. Watch it. He won't tell you the coffee. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Charity, the Port Wall separated. 
subsequently adopted onto the RAF retirement plan by Tornado Extremes and today by Eurofighter Typhoon. In Malta, the gladiators, the sea gladiators, put up a dogged defence, though inevitably they found themselves more effective against the Fiat CR-32 and the CR-42 biplanes. Yeah. 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 They were up against from Italy's Air Force, the Regia Aeronautica, and the <laughs> it was fought at the height of the battle on the 1st of August 1940 at Robra in Plymouth to defend not just that part of the UK, but especially the vital naval dockyards in Plymouth. But they had no success either by day or but the change the tactics, tactics by night. In the official record of fighter squadrons that contributed during the Battle of Britain, there's also a fleet air arm unit to be found, a four squadron with sea gladiators flying from Paxton on Orkney. There we go, an aircraft with the markings of number 73 squadron, Royal Air Force, as flown by New Zealand at Cobber Cave. The dark plane is against a dark sky, alas. This is the 1860 model of Kenneth Aviation, which now lives here as old. It's a very significant aircraft, the T-6 Texan or Harvard. It's quite a part of the number of allies both before, during and after World War II. It also made the name of its manufacturer, North American Aviation. and the result was one of the great fighters of World War II. For the little while, to perfect the initial design, the North American DC-1 was supplied as a harbor class one for the RAF from 1938 onwards. In the UK, because of the risk of aerial attack, there was a need identified to move training efforts to locations further afield, away from the possible attentions of the enemy. And the UK-based service flying training school was equipped with R3 as short air control platforms. The RAF also used them in Malaya, the light strike duties against communist gangs and darkness up over there. Also used the aircraft on the front line in the war in Algeria. The Bear in 1942 vintage, 86D model, into land. Courtesy of Senate Aviation, and that was John Beatty giving us the Havilland wanted between the wars to produce an affordable light aeroplane for the masses. 
system. The leader one of the pair, DBLV, was the eighth box built, and in 1925 was flown by Alan Cobham and delivered to the Lancashire Aero Club at Woodford in Cheshire. Uh, it was damaged at Castle Bromwich in 19... And the two DH-60 moths now are running in. behind is a Hermes box. I'll tell you about that in just a second. Uh, GEBWD was built in 1928 and initially used by the Brooklyn School of Fox. The very first DH-60 moths uh, were built at Stag Lane near Hendon and uh, in February 1925 they were initially priced at £885. between this aircraft and the Tiger Moth, other than the inverted engine on the Tiger Moth, is that the Tiger Moth fuselage frame is made of steel tube, where this is an all wooden aeroplane. A few moths in the mid-1930s were built as the DH-60M, and they actually had the metal tube fuselage of the... what the, the, would then be used as the Tiger Moth. Ironically, the roles were then reversed in World War II when the DH-82B Queen B was created. And they used the fuselage frames of the original DH-60 because they wanted an old wooden frame because the Queen B was being used as a flying target and was operated by remote control. And they didn't want any metal structure in the fuselage getting in the way of the radio control. landing training and one seems to have served aboard HMS Furious as a hack and communications aircraft with 801 squadron. <laughs> the last fleet air arm unit meanwhile to the center of the aircraft with rubber bungees actually acting as the springing medium. Now if you look closely at the second aircraft it's got the later model undercarriage, which has actually got sprung tubes and no solid axle between them. And if you look closely at the Tiger Moth on the line, you'll find the undercarriage on that Tiger Moth is like... You can see there's a bulky of it. And uh, that literally is the fuel tank. And it has the simplest fuel system in the world. Gravity feed. The tank's on the top wing. There's a tap and a pipe down to the carburetor. Nothing to go wrong. No fuel tank. One more minute, I'll call him. And that okay, I was literally stood the test of time. So G E B L V the Cirrus moth there into land go around from the Hermes moth. Scott Butler, who's actually now uh, a, a regular moth pilot, and flying flying the uh, 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 just literally over the horizon uh, for many, many years, combined that with uh, a Royal Air Force career as an air tanker pilot, flying TriStar amongst other things, has now got an airline career and is flying as a pilot with the Shuttleworth Collection, also owns his own diminutive um, turbulent 
uh, car with the Volkswagen engine, which he uh, flies with great glee and gusto is the best way I could describe that. And it's heading now onto final approach again, the runway now clear. Bear in mind again, these aircraft are brakeless, they don't have any brakes, they're relying on the retardation of the tail skin, literally uh, digging into the turf. So you'll probably see a wheel of landing here to keep the airflow over the rudder, keeping the stick just gently moving forward. Now if you watch the elevators, you can see the elevators depressing and depressing and depressing to keep that rudder up into the airflow to be directional control. And now as the tail comes down, the tail skid acts as a brake, brings the aircraft to a standstill. That's nice some activity over on the far side of the airfield. You can get ready with the wind feeling like it's dropped off a little bit of late for our World War One segment. Hey, is the Bristol Scout and see this is a machine with a quite magnificent background to it. It is indeed. I was actually privileged to be at Bisto just by coincidence on the day the aeroplane made its first flight. It is the only airworthy Bristol Scout in the world, don't you think? As the Bristol fighter positions, it's worth reflecting on the, for want of a better phrase, personal journey that David Bremner has been on with the Bristol Scout. We just saw him flying. But that link is actually provided by this very Bristol F2B because in September 19th. to a Shuttleworth display here at Old Warden. The logbook had belonged to his grandfather who flew this Bristol fighter off HMS Argus. Well, there's a stronger naval collection, connection with the uh, Sopwith pup uh, because the first in the line of Sopwith's, then Hawker's uh, single seat fighter entered service in 1916, first with the Royal Naval Air Service before the Royal Flying Corps realising the benefits of the aeroplane and its lightness and agility followed suit. The Naval Air Service also used it for pioneering sea trials and in 1917 one made the first ever landing on a ship at sea. <laughs> Oh, Warden. 
and well, combined age of these two aircraft, well in excess of 200 years. December 1916 onwards, making a lot of use of one of its greatest attributes, which was its excellent high altitude capability. Looks like we're bringing the pup in to land now. sound of using the ignition blitz switch and as he shuts the aircraft down I think put your hands together I've never seen the pup taxi quite like that before and contrasting styles now as the Bristol fighter whispers in over the head Thank you. 
For longest commercial flights in terms of time aloft still ever made in aviation history were made by Catalinas. Between 1943 and 1945, Qantas Airlines flew weekly between Perth and Colombo in the Indian Ocean. 3,592 nautical miles, and the flights took between 28 and 32 hours in the air. They were known as the double sunrise flights as the, pilot, as the passengers saw two sunrises on every flight.
with 360 degree visibility near enough, Ben, I know you've done it, so I'm very, very envious. Yes, I did, but only for about five minutes from Cambridge to uh, Duxford, and the view we got there was mostly queuing traffic, I think, on the uh, N11. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the uh, very, very beautiful shape of the PBY 5A out in front of us, and uh, the largely white livery was chosen by Plain Sailing, not least because it's quite useful for putting sponsors' logos on sometimes when they undertake corporate work, which they also do with this aeroplane.
the invasion stripes on this aeroplane reflect the fact that fleet air arm martlets for Thank <laughs> you. 
more than Joker. The team that he called it at the Flying Legend shows at Duxford. <laughs> Uh, when it was then rebuilt by fighter rebuilders. 
So we'll see them as a second trio, coordinating as best they possibly can. Their arrival overhead the airfield to slot in behind the faster fighters of the initial three ship. While we were, uh, we were talking earlier, Steve, about the efforts of the uh, volunteers here as the gladiator rolls, let's just listen to these. Close the show. We did rather wonder whether that um, might happen. Obviously, there was a good chance that it was going to be able to fly at one point, but uh, sadly, the weather today has put pay to uh, that. Our apologies, but of course, these aircraft we don't we don't even need to say it, do we, Steve? To the knowledgeable audience here at Old Warden. No, it is a century old design for the Triple and uh, it's not just the wind itself. Actually, there's quite a lot of convective weather. You'll ever see the the, the uh, was briefly approaching diagonal to its. Uh, um, uh, to its intention, intended uh, direction uh, there. And you can see the aeroplane just moving around. Now that triplane's about half the weight and has about half the control responses. So it's not entirely surprising that uh, that has uh, perhaps been deemed uh, discretion being the better part of balance. That was beautifully three-pointed on with the, uh, the Hawker Demon there. Uh, the hurricane on the downwind lake and the Lysander uh, just circulating up to the north of the airfield as the other two aircraft are coming. Oh, the two brothers who put the Dave was that really has experienced the range of naval aircraft in the course of the program. We had Rob ship bringing in the uh, Demon Mayor. He's the other part of the back, he's going to have a few more things 
And I'm sure the Lysander is going to be one of the stars of the show at our next evening air show, which is uh, not just for the pirates, but for all the shuffle with volunteers that make, <laughs> that make these air shows such a success. Now, the Lysander runs in. And if they're the season, the plane is closing around the day today. Thank you all for joining us and sharing our tribute to the pilots of the Royal Navy and the Fleet Air Arms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Feels like the weather's about to uh, come into us uh, with a vengeance, I'd say, but certainly in such a way as to preclude the uh, triplane from flying. A quick note, the uh, last departure, as we know it, of the shuttle bus back to Biggleway Railway Station will be at 6.30pm from outside the shop and visitor centre. So if you are intending to get the shuttle bus back to Biggleway Station, it's going at half past six this evening. If I may just make a, an announcement please for visiting pirates, I have, have requested that you come to the tower gate to head back onto the airfield to air side at the end of the flying display. So to the tower gate uh, to get back to air side to get to your aeroplane. Thank you. It's a rash.